Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I, I really look forward to talking together. I had a, um, one of my teachers actually would say, never talk at 2 o'clock because everybody wants to go to sleep. So <laughs> I will try to make this interesting for everybody um, to, to help with that. I'm a social worker, a professor of social work. So what I'm offering today is a point of view that we developed um, over the course of working with schools um, in Chicago, Illinois, where there's great poverty and also great community violence. So what this means is that the, the teachers are teaching students who, relative to the general United States population, are much more illiterate. Um, even the high school students read just at the fourth grade level. Um, the, they have uh, generations of deep poverty and they also suffer from racism. And because of a lot of problems that you've probably heard about in the news, um, the teachers teach in schools where there's maybe gang warfare going on and the playground after school. Um, there may be drive-by shootings of uh, gang members and so the school suddenly goes on lockdown. Nobody can go in or out. The students have to duck down. The teachers duck down. It's actually physically dangerous. And as you can imagine, the students are agitated and traumatized. So we work in the schools providing various kinds of support for the teachers, and we also have after-school programming for the children. So um, to start out, I'm going to tell you about a frame of reference for uh, the teachers that, that we use when we're consulting with them um, for helping those children who are vulnerable. So for those of you, um, you know, mentioning diversity, for example, we would be talking about those students who come from poor families, at-risk families, who might have some, um, you know, serious or less serious learning disabilities, uh, and um, children of at-risk families where the parents may have substance abuse problems or, or mental disabilities or children in foster care or recently adopted who feel insecure. So we have all of these students in all of our countries. And a uh, question would be, if you're a teacher, what is your state of mind about helping these students in particular? So first, I'll start with some theory about this, which I'm, I'm grateful also to our Ignatian Pedagogy Center at Loyola, where um, we, we as faculty are frequently have the opportunity to learn about education and the Ignatian tradition. And they emphasize the formation and transformation of the student through love. So perhaps it sounds corny in a highly sophisticated academic setting like this, but the idea is that the relationship with the teacher is, and the relationship the teacher strives to create with the students can actually help promote a healthy development in the mind of the student. And it's especially important for these vulnerable students. So what are some theoretical guidelines that we use? Well, one, one con important idea is, is known as transference. For those of you with a you know, psychodynamic orientation, the way the student comes into the classroom is significantly affected by other early relationships in their life. And so when you see the child who, even though they don't know you, they're afraid of you, or they're expecting you'll be harsh and they'll resent the teacher, we realize these feelings are unreasonable, but that it, the child is importing into the relationship with the teacher experiences from other relationships. And so a way that we advise the teachers to help them with these difficult students who are frightened or angry is to say, the student will be constantly surprised by your kindness and by your understanding. And it's not really about you. This is the student's way of communicating stresses that the student has had to endure. And maybe there'll even be opportunities to discuss it. So the idea of this negative transference is a way to help teachers not take the student's behavior personally. 
Um, so these are some examples of uh, negative transference. Um, and some of the ways it happens is the family has a culture where the, the school is regarded as a negative place with mean teachers. Um, the child may learn to take out their anger on others. And if the teacher has to, in some way, impose limits or discipline for the child, the parents blame the teacher rather than understanding why this is necessary. So as one example of what one teacher did um, with the, such parents and a child, is that the teacher was urging the parents to get more help for their child. The parents refused, as often happens. And that teacher said, well, why don't you just come and meet with me? And let's talk about what's happening as you try to help your child. For an hour every month, these parents met with this very patient teacher. And after about six months, the parents said to the teacher, it actually feels good to be listened to. I think we would like some help. So it took that kind of patience, that kind of dedicated care, but it did result in a very important change for that family and that student. Um, so looking uh, a bit more deeply about how teachers can think about um, forming better attachments with their students, we can draw from the psychological theory of Heinz Kohut, one of the um, uh, uh, theoreticians in psychodynamic theory in Chicago, actually. Um, so he emphasizes three strong needs that everybody has um, as a child. And they frequently are not met in at-risk families and stressed families. But when these needs are met, children become more confident and resilient and able to frame and pursue realistic goals. So we talk to the teachers about these needs that their students have. And I'll describe them more thoroughly. One is someone strong to idealize, which usually would mean in the classroom setting a strong, calm, reassuring teacher. A mirroring of the students' goals and accomplishments. So um, understanding on an individual basis for a student, what is their goal that they want to accomplish in learning? And what, what for that student represents progress? And the third is a sense of belonging in a cooperative rather than a competitive community. So the idealization of the teacher um, represents maybe the best example would be when your children fall down when they're very young and they hurt their knee and they run to the, you as a parent and all you have to do is hug them and they feel better. So we know that a loving relationship has this analgesic calming effect. So we encourage teachers in such environments to try to promote this way of relating with children. Even the hard to handle teenagers will find that they're calmer when they feel they can turn to the teacher with griefs they experienced. We found even the toughest young men can be calmed if they know this is a teacher who will listen to them and treat them with dignity. And it's interesting, the child then, when they have this kind of relationship, because they're calmer, they can learn more easily. Uh, and often, when you see students who have trouble sustaining attention, they overreact to uh, difficult situations like tests. They might be cynical about others, saying you can't trust anyone. These are the kinds of problems that happen in those young people that did not have a stable figure to idealize. And so they then um, turn to the teacher to meet these really deep needs. And the, the teacher can also meet another need that, that is universal, according to Kohut, the need to be mirrored. And you see this on the playground when um, even not your own children, but especially your own children, will say, look what I can do. Look what I can do. So the, th the four-year-olds are very open about it. The tough teenagers feel the same needs, but they are unlikely to say it. 
So the teacher, the more they can recognize, admire, and appreciate their students' accomplishments, the more stable their students will become. So, um, and one of the things that's very important about this vulnerable group of students is that because of wider societal problems, you know, like the um, fact that they've never seen anyone from their family graduate from high school, or they um, experience a degradation because of their race, or um, people ignore them, which is often one form that racism takes in the United States, the children's self-esteem is wounded and their hope is dented. And these children have great trouble then forming realistic goals. So even if a teacher can say, so starting from here, where do you want to be next year? What's your goal? What do you hope for? It then uh, repairs this uh, problem a student can have in goal formation. And every time the student takes a step toward that goal, the teacher mirrors it. So it gives the teacher a way to think about working with these children that's based on the student's own goals. Uh, of course, teachers have their own learning goals for students, right? We all do. But it's also important for a teacher to be able to work with a student according to the student's own goals. That becomes your leverage for helping the student manage their behavior. One of our young people, um, when we asked him what meant so much to him about, what meant the most to him about being in our youth program after school, said it's that I could feel like I'm a leader of everyone to tell the truth. So he had this deep-seated goal that he had never before felt met. And, and this was what was meaningful to him, was a mirroring for this goal. And finally, there's a classroom as a community of belonging. So this is really different from the competitive model of education, right? So certainly the way I was raised and an approach to education that's very, very common is the students will do better if they compete with each other for the best grade, right? But when you already have environments that are full of violence and nobody feels like they're cooperating or helping each other, if you create a lot of competition in the classroom, you can incite more violence. So, so how do you create cooperation? So what you want to do then is think of the classroom as a positive social network where you want to help the students feel a sense of twinship or affinity or belonging. You know, you, we belong in the special group together. And I, I just had one example of how this works. Sometimes twinship between peers, sometimes twinship between teacher and student. So my daughter in particular will say to me, if something is stressful, did you go through this when you were a child? And if I say yes, and now I'm fine, she'll go, okay. Right, and teachers stu and stu students will want to do that with the teacher. Do you remember that you made a mistake on a test? Um, did you find that it felt difficult? And as the teacher says that and the students share common stress, this feeling of belonging and twinship and affinity grows and it promotes stability in the identities of the students. It also reduces violence. So I wanted to spend the last part of the talk talking about some specific approaches for reducing aggression and building an empathic school community. Um, the first one is from Canada. Uh, it's the Roots of Empathy program. Has anybody heard of this? No? Okay, well that's good. I'm glad that you learned something from my talk today. <laughs> so the Roots of Empathy program, you can actually see it working on YouTube. It was created by a Canadian um, educator. And she shows you how to carry it out, and then they've also done systematic research on it. And it specifically was designed to reduce the incidence of bullying in uh, a primary level <laughs> school. Okay? I think it could be used in high schools too. And so they did systematic research and they found it really does reduce bullying. 
And it's a surprising intervention um, to reduce bullying. They don't talk about bullying. Instead, what they do is they invite parents of babies to come to the class. And, and the examples are uh, very diverse parents. So parents of all different colors, all different religious backgrounds uh, come to the class. And the parent sits right in the middle of the classroom like this with the baby. The baby might be eight, nine, ten months old, not walking yet, right? And the, the parent and the baby are relating, and the teacher guides the student's reflections on what's going on between the parent and the baby. And the teacher asks questions like, so what do you think the baby is feeling now? And, oh, gee, the baby looked a little bit unhappy. Why do you think that is? So what the teacher's doing is guiding the students to develop the capacity to empathize with others, using this example of the tiny baby and the parent. When the parent hugged the baby, why do you think the baby felt better? Um, how do you think the parent's feeling now? And the curriculum has a set of guided questions that the teachers can ask of the students. And so they do this several times over the course of the semester. And what they believe happens is it increases students' empathy with those who are vulnerable. And as you all know, a lot of bullying happens against a student who's perceived as more vulnerable, right? So it, it's really actually very effective. And you can also see because they intentionally involve people of different colors with different religious backgrounds that it reduces um, xenophobia and ethnocentrism as well. You, the students start to see the common humanity right across all these diversities. Another really valuable approach is called the Peacemakers Program. And this you can actually buy the curriculum in English on Amazon. And it's been very thoroughly researched um, for uh, about 20 years by authors Johnson and Johnson. Um, and it, the curriculum starts at the kindergarten level and goes all the way up through high school. So you, they have researched entire schools that use this program. It's very effective in reducing conflict. And the way that it works, um, they show the, a really simple kindergarten example, and here you can see it on YouTube, and then it becomes more sophisticated, is um, the students learn if they're disagreeing about something. For example, um, one stu both students want to use the red crayon in kindergarten. So what happens? Do they get into a fight about using the red crayon, or do they learn how to resolve the conflict? So the way this approach works is they have like a big mat and the students start out on either side of the mat and one student says what uh, she wants and the other student says what she wants and then this student restates what this student wants and this student restates what this student wants and they move a step together. And then this student says an idea for how they could both get what they want and then this student says an idea for how they could both get what they want, and they restate each other's ideas and they take a step together. Then they say another idea the same way, and they restate it and they take a step together, and then they decide which of their four ideas they're going to agree on, and then they shake, right? So that's the kindergarten model, right? It becomes more sophisticated as the students get older, and they actually have some students who wear like a special jacket. Every day, there's another student who's a peer mediator in every grade, and they're on the playground with the kids. They might go to classes and mediate conflicts. And over the course of a year, every student is a peer mediator at least once. So the students learn to be leaders in making peace, as well as the recipients of the peacemaking. And it's quite a remarkable curriculum. Um, we used it in one of our high schools where the only thing a teacher knew to, knew to do when students fought was to put them in a room together by themselves and let them fight it out. It was really a desperate environment. And those students loved this program because it gave them a framework and a structure 
to become cooperative with each other and an alternative to fighting. So it's really good, a structured way to reduce violence in schools. The last example is a program that, that we developed um, in the United States and we're just um, finally studying the, the final effects of it. But we developed it because we started experimenting in our after school programs and we had our older kids go work in an elementary school and mentor younger children. It, we paid them a salary to do this. Um, and at first we were very afraid, you know, like what if they recruit these young children into gangs? What if they hurt them in some way, et cetera? So we developed what we call a cross-age mentoring model um, where we train the older kids in how to be mentors. Then they actually mentor the younger kids in a, you know, activity, whether it's gardening or um, sometimes dancing or it might be reading together. Um, and then we debrief the, the mentors for an hour after their mentoring session. So for example, one time a little mentee threw a book at the mentor and we saw the mentor go like this because they were hurt by the book and that was what they learned, right? If somebody, child does something you don't like, they get hit. And so we were able to talk to the mentor about feeling angry when someone hurts you or a child doesn't do what you want. We debriefed the mentors and we asked the mentors, you know, after this first phase of our program, they interview each other and tell us what they like about their services. And uh, they said the thing they liked the most was being a mentor. It was really for them an extremely powerful intervention. The little children look up to them and they feel worthwhile. Um, when there was a drive-by shooting, the older kids, their first commitment was we want to help our young mentees with how they feel about the shooting. So they become very protective. And some of them actually said to us in these interviews, now I won't abuse my children because now I know what to do if children are bad besides hit them. So we were, we were excited by this and got some money to do a larger project. And for those of you who are interested, you can see more about the project on this website. It can be done in a school. Um, it's part of what in US we call social emotional learning. So the, the things we found is that the better to have about two years of difference between older kids and the mentees. And the more stability you can have in relationship between mentor and mentee, the better. But sometimes in chaotic communities and chaotic after school programs, the same kids don't come regularly enough and you can organize it in a small family style. That intimacy is important, so maybe 10 mentors to 10 mentees at the most. Even smaller works a little bit better. But it's an exciting model for reducing violence and creating positive social networks in poor communities where unfortunately there's a lot of negative social networks that socialize the children in very destructive ways. Okay, so thank you for your time and your listening, everybody. I look forward to hearing.